hi everyone and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to part two of my chat with dr sean baker um in this particular episode we will be talking about gi diseases for example irritable bowel syndrome which um is so prevalent it's like every person that i talk to these days has it so as a last topic well there's plenty more but um we talk about how is it you know how every culture is completely different so for example can japanese people consume meat products and digest them the same way for example a german person can so these are very interesting topics if you are interested or you are considering the carnivore diet so as usual if you enjoyed this video give it a big thumbs up and i hope you learned something let's go so um, I want to talk about chronic problems. Now, I feel as though carnivore diet works best on people that have chronic problems. So for example, if someone had arthritis, would you treat them with a carnivore diet? Uh, yeah, absolutely, I would. And I say that as an orthopedic surgeon whose whole career was done treating people with arthritis now it may not work i'll be yep. the first to say that and I, I also say but it would be one of my first interventions you know before i put people on drugs uh non anti-inflammatory drugs which i used to hand out like candy before i would inject people mm -hmm. with cortisone into their joints which i used to do all the time and certainly before i'd operate on people i would ask them to do now many of them won't do it you know you got to you know i mean the real realistic is not a lot of people are going to be willing to change their diet but i would say that, that would be my first thing i would suggest is try and reduce at the very least, cut out sugar, cut out processed grains, cut out these highly processed vegetable oils that are part of the, 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 you know, this is, if we look at any processed food, you go to the grocery store and look at all the junk food that's in boxes, you're going to see ingredient one is usually some sort of processed grain product, uh, often wheat or flour or corn. And then the next ingredient is going to be some sort of vegetable oil, often canola, canola oil or mm -hmm. you know, soybean oil or corn oil or whatever, safflower oil. And then somewhere in there is often going to be some kind of sugar or sweetener, you know, that's mm -hmm. straight up sugar or maltodextrin. Anyway, yeah. so you cut all that junk out and, and then, you know, uh, and then see how you do. And then if you're still having issues, then I'd say, Hey, let's start taking out some of these other foods that are considered healthy, the whole grains, and maybe the fruits and vegetables, and, and and go down, taper down to just crazy enough, just meat, and do that for a couple months, and then report back and see what you do. And I will tell you that, I mean, I've literally seen thousands and thousands of people with that same scenario, they've got arthritis, and it goes away, or the symptoms go away, which is the, the, the important part. You know, the x-ray may not change, but they don't hurt anymore, and that's all they care about. You know, I don't care what my number of this is or whatever this lab is. I want to – most people, at the end of the day, they want to feel good. They don't want to feel sick. They want to be happy. They don't want to be in pain. Yep. If you can fix that, I think that's that's a huge, huge win for, for both you as a physician or a healthcare provider and for uh, the patient. And so this diet has done that over and over again you know if you're like, for those you know if you're in if you've never heard about this go to meetrx.com click on our success stories you can literally yeah. see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonials some of them are mind-blowing uh, and they're categorized by category arthritis autoimmune diseases allergies you know diabetes cardiac disease all skin diseases on and on and on and on so we categorize that so you can so sort, of sort through that if, it, if that matches you uh but yeah so arthritis that's what i would do um, you know, I would give it probably a good solid three months. The data we have mm -hmm. on people tend to show that the three month point seems to be an inflection point for mm -hmm. many people get better within a few days, but for most people, you know, we see at three months, there's a, there's a pretty good point. So if it doesn't work by three months, yep. then I would say, yeah, maybe it's not going to work. And, you know, you can, you know, maybe try some different route, but that, but that's, that's how I would approach it for most people okay. in this condition. Okay. All right. Interesting. Um, what about people that have um irritable bowel syndrome? I see it just everywhere now. I was talking to a gastroenterologist. I interviewed her yesterday. She was telling me that she doesn't believe in uh, carnivore diets. She told me that um, they cause heart disease. There's quite a few studies that have shown that uh, people with irritable bowel syndrome have actually cured themselves after going carnivore for, was it three months? And I find that interesting. So can you tell us a bit more about um, carnivore diet and like GI problems? 
Yeah. Uh, first of all, to the, the 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 GI doctor that doesn't believe in the carnivore diet, well, it exists whether you believe or not. I mean, you know, if you don't believe the effic- efficacy, that's a different mm-hmm. story. But, um, you know, the the belief that the carnivore diet causes heart disease, I would challenge her to point to a study on the carnivore diet that shows it causes heart disease. I'd also challenge her to point to a single randomized control trial that shows that meat causes cardiovascular disease. All you can do is look at uh, epidemiology studies, which are just absolutely abysmal for showing causation. You know, we have these large population studies where someone hands them a questionnaire and says, hey, how much of this or that did you eat in the last year? And no one gets it right. They are widely inaccurate and they come out with these tiny relative risk increases, which are basically meaningless. That is no way to hang, you you can't hang your hat on that to say that is good science. This is not. So if you can show me a randomized controlled child that shows that people eating meat, only meat, Certainly not, you're not going to see that, or even just more meat, have more heart disease in a randomized control trial that was properly controlled and, and, and done to look at that endpoint. I will, I will happily share that with the world, but that's never been done. Okay. In fact, there's evidence to the point the exact opposite. Um, you know, the, the, the so-called vegan diets have been tested for that. And every single vegan, vegan randomized control, because there are vegan randomized control trials, none of them none of them have shown that a vegan diet prevents or improves heart disease. You know, there's no randomized control trial that shows that either. So these people that are doing this are basing it on extremely poor, weak science and ideologic beliefs, okay? Okay. Uh, But as far as the gut function, IBS, you're right, is extremly common. I think in the United States, it's something like 20% of the population has it as a diagnosis and probably undiagnosed there's probably a significant percentage more and that yeah. that mirrors obesity it mirrors metabolic syndrome and i think what we're seeing what's probably causing that again is a modern garbage food i mean this is what we're seeing it's destroying the gut some of the medications some of the supplements probably you know add on to that um and so the more we go back to older foods and meat is one of the oldest foods humans have ever consumed in fact mm-hmm. meat is what made us human i think there's a good argument for that we see improvements in gut health. And one of the things, there's a nice uh, a group in Hungary, uh, they're called the Paleo Medicina Group, and they uh, uh, they have done extensive research looking at carnivore diets, and they call it a paleolithic ketogenic diet. It's basically a meat-based diet that you have ketogenic macronutrient ratios. And they have shown over and over again with thousands of patients that uh, by eliminating all these other foods, including fruits and vegetables, crazily or not, and just going with meat and, and some fat, and they include organ meat in their in their in their particular uh, version. Um, that gut permeability, which they measure through something called PEG 400 polyethylene glycol 400, which is a pretty sophisticated sophisticated way to measure gut permeability. And now our gut has some level of permeability, which is normal, but what we often see is this hyperpermeability. And so now, things that are not supposed to be transported across the gut barrier bacterial lipopolysaccharides and other other nasty things now come in across our body and so that is very inflaming and irritating to the entire gut itself uh leading to probably some of this ibs stuff and it's also causing these other reactions in the body perhaps autoimmune diseases there's a nice researcher uh alessio faisano out of uh Boston Children's University has looked extensively at gut permeability and autoimmune disease and sees a very strong and compelling link with that. And so, uh, yes, so IBS is one of the things that we see very frequently gets better with a carnivore diet. Now, albeit, I will tell you that the chronic gut disease, whether it's IBS or IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, Mm -hmm. like Crohn's disease, or also a rate of colitis, which we also see tremendous success with, often takes longer. You know, where I talk talk about three months for most of these things, like the -the run-of-the-mill you know, diabetes or psoriasis or something like that. These gut issues can sometimes take six months, sometimes a year before they improve. And not everybody gets full relief. I mean, um, you know, but I've seen consistently enough people get significant relief, many of them to the point where, you know, particularly with these inflammatory, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, where they come off all their medications, they come off these expensive immune uh, modulating drugs, these expensive biologics, these Humira's and other you know, very expensive, very high side effect prone medications, and they're able to leave that, which is which is really really amazing. Wow. Okay. From what I can actually hear now, I didn't try it for long enough. I was only like hard carnival for six weeks, so I didn't try it. Well, I mean, you know, it's uh, we often sort of try to 
sponsor people to do it for 30 days. You know, there's always a 30 day. Do it in the May, the May challenge, the June challenge. We always have that. Yeah. Uh, because most people are willing to commit for 30 days. Yeah. But what I found is, you know, for many people, not all, many people, some people feel tremendous within two weeks. They're like, wow, this is the best of them. And, you know, you yourself, you said I lost six kilos and things, yeah, things happen. But some of these other issues, these long seated issues do tend to take a little longer to resolve. And, and yes, sometimes it takes three months or even longer for some people. But, but uh, you know, I think you should see things moving in the right direction generally. Some people, you know, they need like, this is one of the reasons we've set up this large uh, community at meterx.com. We've got just this huge support system where we have mm-hmm. thousands of members and thousands of people, meetings all day long. We have, you know, conference meetings where hundreds of people meet every day, 24 hours a day. We have a huge, we have an Australian group that, that meets in there. We've got people from all around the world because of the time zone difference. You know, I'm usually on, I'm there every day at 9 a.m. Pacific time, which is like 2 a.m. in somewhere in Australia. And mm-hmm. I, I actually get people from Australia that get up at two o'clock in the morning to come to the meeting, which I think they're nuts, cool. but uh, we do see that. And uh, and so, yes, it, it may be something that I would say for gut issues, I would I would certainly say three week, three months and maybe even six for some people. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Well, I'm going to try it again. I am. I'm going to put it in. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever treated any Greek uh, people? Like um, I'm talking like <laughs> Greek uh, clients who have had chronic problems and who have been cured. Well, I, I don't remember if I treated anyone in actually in Greece. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've treated people of Greek descent yes, uh, you know, that. that are Greek. And I don't know that they're really from a human standpoint they're all kind of the same to me i know greece has a wonderful history of some wonderful meats you know particularly i think lamb is something that's very very well known there i'm yet to go to greece i really hope to go there at some point in my life i know it's there's some beautiful parts uh but yes i mean i have and and you know i like i said i don't know that i would you know i mean there you know other than you know maybe putting it in con- uh, cultural context of foods that they might find might prefer uh that, that, that fit that paradigm. And there's, there's certain, you know, Greek specialty foods that mm-hmm. are animal based and you might have to modify the recipes a little bit to, mm-hmm. to make it work fully. But I, I have, I can't, you know, I can't point to exact, you know, one person exactly, but I, I know that because I, I, I've literally interacted with thousands and thousands of people over the years. And so, yes, mm-hmm. there have been at least several that have been, that have, that have been Greek. Okay. So there's this thing now going around. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's like, uh, people that claim that carnivore diet only works for people who have been consuming meat in past generations. Um, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, I, I I would sort of disagree with that. You know, I've got mm-hmm. I've got people in India, you know, uh-huh. India, which is the most vegetarian nation on the planet, <laughs> thriving on carnivore. I mean, they've got generations of being vegetarian. And I, you know, there, there's, in fact, there's a guy in India, he's got 200,000 YouTube followers in car. He's converted tens of thousands of people in India to do a carnivore diet. I've seen people from Asia, all sorts. I've seen people from African descent. I've seen people from, you know, Northern European and Southern European, including India, including Greece and Italy and all these places that do that. Now, what I will say is that where you sort of evolved you know, historically, ancestrally, you know, maybe going back hundreds of years or thousands of years, mm-hmm. probably better prepares you to eat some non-meat items. Well, let's just use dairy as, as one of the most glaring examples. There are about a third of the population in the world that are lactose tolerant, and about mm-hmm. two thirds of the world are lactose intolerant. And that has to do with exposure to dairy about 10,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago, whenever those parts of the world's domesticated dairies. There are some people that are more tolerant to grains. You know, these are mm-hmm. people that perhaps uh, evolved in the Middle East where, where agriculture, you know, at least in theory, it started. And there's people that are more tolerant to certain other things. But I think everybody, all human beings, meat is something people tolerate. In fact, um, when you look at sensitivities or difficulties with food, and, and I had a, the pleasure of talking with a, with a researcher from uh, Cambridge University when I was lecturing in Malaysia, uh, I guess it's been about a year and a half ago. And he did, he's looked at something like 5 million, he's done 5 million tests on something, you know, wow. a quarter of a million people a year for like 20 years or something like that. And what he found unequivocally was the only food, the most well-tolerated food among all human beings of five million people 
was basically red meat. Everybody seemed to tolerate that pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. People did have trouble with fish and chicken and shellfish and, uh, you know, different other types of animals and certainly lots of plant foods, whether it's, you know, fruits and vegetables and grains and mm -hmm. you know, all those glutens and lectins and all those types of things. So I think that some people are adapted to handle other foods better than other people. You know, we look at Asians and say, well, they eat a lot of rice and they're pretty healthy and they're, they've, been, they've been eating it for mm -hmm. arguably thousands of years and, and, and they're and there's probably some truth to that. Um, but to say that you can't do a meat-based diet because you can also eat those other foods, I think is, is, is where, the, where the misconception is or the yeah. uh, confusion lies in that. And so, uh, and you know, some people are like, oh, you know, my grandmother makes this wonderful this or that. And uh, you know, I, I like it too much. And therefore I can't, you know, I hear it at Italians all the time. Well, I can't give up my pasta. You know, because, uh, you know, or, you know, you hear, you know, Americans, I can't give them my junk food. You know? oh. <laughs> That's what we're known for. You know, but I mean, it's, it's I think it's more uh, sort of being culturally ingrained than physiologically or biologically yeah. ingrained. I see what you mean. All right. Um, where can people find you online? Yeah. So the pre my preferred place to people find me is, mm -hmm. is meetrx.com. I'm there mm -hmm. every day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it may not be convenient for the Australians, but around the world um, at 9 a.m. Pacific time, then you can just interact and directly talk. Cause I like to be able to talk to people. It's more nuanced. Other than that, I'm on social media. I have okay. a YouTube channel. It's called, it's called Sean Baker, S-H-A-W-N-B-A-K-E-R. Yep. And I try to put some, you know, 10 minute, five, 10 minute clip on every day. Sometimes I'm talking about studies. Sometimes I'm talking about some silliness or whatever, but I mean, I'm, I'm usually there. My Instagram is my biggest social media account. I've got about 180,000 people following me on that. It's just Sean, S-H-A-W-N-B-A-K-E-R, 1967. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Twitter for those that are more sophisticated, I guess, you know, it's a little more higher level discussion there. S Baker MD. And then I'm also, I just started on God forbid on TikTok because uh, oh, okay. I, I want to impact. Yeah. I want to impact some of the younger folks. I know the younger folks, are, I think it's the message they need to hear. They need to understand that meat is not the bad guy because they are literally being brainwashed and fed this propaganda about you've got to eat plant-based so it's it's you know it's we didn't get a chance to talk about the environmental aspect of it but i will tell you there's a lot of misinformation about the environmental side of this whole um whole 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 deal i've got five minutes to go did you want to talk about that just quickly uh, well yeah i mean again this is a, this this merits a, an hour-long discussion quite okay. honestly but i mean okay, basically <laughs> the, yeah i mean i'll just give you the some the highlights okay. basically the summary that not eating animals or giving up animal agriculture is the best thing we can possibly do to impact the plant to prevent climate change or global warming yep. is not supported by any amount of evidence you know we keep hearing these numbers uh, floated by vegans about oh animal agriculture is worse than transportation uh, you know, they're, they're using this based on a 2006 study called Livestock's Long Shadow, where they did a lifestyle assessment on animal agriculture, which means they calculated greenhouse gas emissions based on everything that goes into animal agriculture, whether it's putting gas in the tractor to mow the fields, to, to harvest some of the grain if they're fed, to, to uh, you know, building the barns, to transporting the meat to the grocery store, and on and on and on. There's thousands of things going on. It's not just how much, you know, gas does the animal emit, you know, through breathing or or belching or even through some or through its manure that was not done they did that for uh they did that for cows where they looked at everything but when they looked at transportation they just looked at what comes out of the tailpipe that's it mm -hmm. so it's not it's not an apple site so if they truly want to do a fair semester they would look at all the steel that goes into making cars all the plastic all the mining yes. that, co that occurs all the roads that are built all the harvesting of fossil fuels that are used to run those cars, uh, how we do that, you know, all the, you know, airports that are built, all the, you know, all the construction that goes in, that would be a true comparison. Mm -hmm. And when we look at that, we would see it'd be no comparison. In fact, the United, in fact, when we look at direct emissions of animal agriculture worldwide, it's 5%, not 14%, 5% transportation is so it's a lot, direct emissions, 14, 15%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not even a third of that, but in the United States, and this is the, also the problem with that is they're looking at, third world and developing countries and so when we look at if we were to roll the clock back in australia a hundred years right animal agriculture would be it would be accountable for like 99 percent of your greenhouse gases a hundred years ago because there were no cars or no significant cars there were no significant factories so when we're looking at third world countries we have that same situation where all these countries are accountable when you look at western countries the united states for example 
when we look at our greenhouse gas footprint, cows produce 2% of our greenhouse gases. Transportation is 28%. Energy is 25%. Industry and industry is like 30%. It's like 80% is fossil fuel. Cows are 2%. So 2% is not zero. It's not the greatest thing in the world. And we all got to cut out. In fact, we know unequivocally if every American gave up and became a vegan, which would be a disaster, by the way. But if all of us did that, and we had to kill all the animals too, we'd have to get rid of all the animals. If we did that, it would reduce world, the worldwide greenhouse gas emissions by 0.4%, not even 1%. And that would be every single American on the planet going vegan full-time and killing all the animals, including all the cats and dogs, you know, the 140 million cats and dogs we have, the 90 million cows, you know, the, you know, the, 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 set, the 9 million horses and all that stuff. That is, you know, what we're making an impact. So it's not that we shouldn't improve the way we graze animals and raise animals. That's not, you know, that's not the point here. The point is eliminating it. The vegan answer to throwing the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. is not the solution. And it's going to cause a lot of people to become sick, malnourished. You cannot grow crops without fertilizer from animals. I mean, this is, you, or, you, or what you do is you spray, you spray on, you know, the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, synthetic, pet, you know, petroleum stuff. I mean, that's worse for the environment. So uh, I think that's, you know, that's one of many arguments we could talk about water and land usage mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But I mean, that's probably the main one that people are concerned about and the legislation is being mm -hmm. uh, talked about. But animals are not the major issue. Can we improve the way we do it? Yes. Should we improve? Yes. But should we all go vegan or even any of us go vegan? No, we shouldn't. Okay. I went vegan for two weeks. I lasted two <laughs> weeks and it was torture. Torture. <laughs> and how about your book? Yeah, my book is called The Carnivore Diet by mm -hmm. Dr. Sean Baker. There's a lot of knockoff versions. I think there's some people, there was a guy named Stephen Baker who wrote a book and just trying to yep. you know, kind of jump on the bandwagon. But yeah, The Carnivore Diet. My book was written for the average person it wasn't okay. it wasn't i mean i you know i used plenty of scientific references in there if you want to look at that but it was really a how-to it was a understanding concept it was something straightforward and i think most people have enjoyed it it's been you know it's been read by you know hundreds you know i think there's a hundred thousand of those have been out there and i think a lot of people have benefited from that so if you want to pick up a copy i know it's i know people in australia have access to it and other parts of the world I've got one. it's on amazon and yeah there you go so it's available so Thanks, Doctor. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I, I'm going to celebrate by having some lamb tomorrow then. You should. <laughs> All right. See you, Doctor. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.